What, what? Welcome to the South by East Podcast. Welcome to the South by East Podcast, where we discuss culture, the scriptures, and everything in between, and how they impact Southeast Topeka with your co-hosts, Jonathan Sublett and Braille Watson. Welcome to the South by East Podcast, where we discuss the scriptures, culture, and everything in between. We are in season two generations of the South by East Podcast, and this is episode three. Ooh. We're getting it in. Braille, why don't you tell us who our guest will be today? Oh, man, that's my pleasure. Uh, the National School Board Association President, Frank Henderson. And yeah. let me tell you a little something about Frank, man. So when I was running around, thought that I was a, a, a political activist, was out here marching in the streets and causing trouble everywhere, I used to use the, uh, the N-word a lot. And yeah. I, had, I had my own thoughts around like how this works. Um, and Frank was one of the first people to come to me in a private message. And he said, hey, young man, I appreciate you. Big fan of my music, got my merch. He always supported. He was like, young man, it hurts your reputation and your integrity when you use that word in public. And I was like, he ain't down. He don't really, he ain't really with old. the struggle. Yeah, he ain't really with the struggle. Like, come on, it's all right. It's all right to you. We taking it back. And it's like, he talked with me, man. He listened, and he talked with me. And there was a few other people that approached me, and they were like, well, if you're not going to, I'm not going to be your friend. And I'm not. I was like, all right. But he was like, okay, I still support you. I still love you. But I just wanted you to know what that does to your influence. I think Paul said not everything that's allowable is profitable. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And it's like, over time, as I just watched, because I listened, I listened, and over time as I watched, he really shifted the way that I moved on social media, the way that I moved in, in public, and allowed me to see past myself. Um, allowed me to see past myself to see what I was doing to my future self. And it's like, so it's exciting for me to be able to sit down with someone who's had that much influence on my life and to know throughout this process, I learned it, that the school boards really direct everything when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to schools that they are really the main vision casters for our school districts. And so I'm excited to see what he has to say about how school boards can help us prepare the story that we were talking about in our last episode. Yeah. So with that said, man, let's jump into an interview with Frank Henderson in the intersection. We are back in the intersection with our brother Frank Henderson, the, the president of the National School Board Association. How you doing today, Frank? Hey, Pastor, I am doing very well. It, it, it's so good to be here with you. Yeah. I mean, it's like I've known you for just a couple of years now. Yeah, right. just, just a few. Yeah, just, just a, a few. few. Yeah, Back yeah. When you were in <laughs> middle school or... Yeah, maybe maybe ninth grade, uh, maybe ninth grade. Like I that. think yeah. so. Yes, so, we we got a lot of. We've been, yeah. down, but God man. has been good. Yeah, man, it's so good to be able to yeah. sit down with you, man. And you know, I've been watching you on Facebook a little bit, and I saw that recently you went to the AASA, the uh, School Superintendent Associations Conference, but you were in San Antonio. Absolutely. And uh, from from what I do know from San Antonio, because um, I got to spend a little bit of time there, they got some fire food. And so mm -hmm. I, I kind of wanted to know, what, what was your favorite meal when you were out mm -hmm. in San Antonio? Well, not like I like food or anything like that. Oh, all. yeah. You know, no. and, me, and, me too. Me too. Yeah, I yeah. just, you know, and, and for, the, not, for the fans. And, yeah. It's for the fans. Yeah. It's not like Mexican food isn't one of my favorites. Oh, you, you know? oh okay. And uh, it's not like I don't like things hot and spicy. You know? <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's like if you're going to eat some food, I want it to talk back at me. You know? Oh, so okay. Anyway. You want it to come out whispering to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. So I, I'm partial to chicken enchiladas. Okay. And uh, while I was down there, I had some fabulous chicken enchiladas with a little bit of 
green sauce and a little spice and mm. that, that, that that was my favorite Some yeah. chicken enchiladas yeah. okay really mm, good sounds, oh yeah that sounds good definitely where yeah. you on what is it it's like a, a pier or the river walk, river walk. Yeah. i was about to say waterfront i'm like what yeah is it? yeah they, they have that river walk down there yeah yeah and it, it's a great conference site and uh, this was superintendent conference as you mm -hmm, had indicated mm -hmm. and so you got superintendents there from all over the country, and uh, I had chance to be able to address them, and actually, uh, in the spirit of our Kansas City Chiefs, it was right okay. after we won the Super, Super Bowl. Bowl. Okay. So I, I kind of centered my remarks around the Super yeah. Bowl <laughs> and, and kind of took advantage of that too. But, but it was a nice. good time, absolutely. Nice, yeah. man. That is great, man. I, I love that you have those opportunities to speak. I mean. Um, you and I have known each other more on a, on a personal level than a yes. professional level. And so I'm just a fan of just your character, your integrity. And so um, I love getting to see all over Facebook people just sharing about how impactful your words were and the things that you did. And um, but I mean, a lot of people I know, they have they really have no idea what a superintendent does or what a what a what a school board is even was even for. And I've had. Um, the opportunity to speak with some on the school board here around Topeka, but just for anyone who may be tuning in and, and may not be familiar, you know, what what really, what does a school board do mm -hmm. and, and why are school boards important, especially for neighborhoods like Highcrest? Well, school boards, like you said, people don't know what they do. And, right. and uh, it, it's kind of funny because some people think, okay, the school board's job is to fire that football coach that doesn't play my kid <laughs> right, right. or to get rid of this teacher because mm -hmm. this teacher gave my child it's, an F on uh, this It's, it's the catch-all for all my problems. It, you know, with the, right. everything that I don't like that's going on school falls board. at the lap of the school board. Right, you know, right. but, it, but in reality, that's not how it is, you mm -hmm. know. And this, this is my 16th year mm -hmm. on USD 345 Seaman School Board that's of so Education. Sick. And... Uh, it, it's been a, a, a very good ride. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be able to serve in that way. Mm -hmm. But the school board members have one employee, first of all, mm. and that is you hire the superintendent. Mm. Okay, And the superintendent then is delegated the responsibility to hire their staff, oversee building principals, oversee directors, who in turn oversee teachers and other staff members. Mm -hmm. But the uh, primary responsibilities of a, a good school board is to establish that clear vision for their district. Hmm. And in order for that to happen, I always say there are some fundamental foundations that we must all agree on, okay? okay? okay. And that is number one, every student matters, mm. okay? And secondly, every student is a gift from God, mm. okay? And then when we pair that and dovetail that with education, we as a society then must realize that a good education is a civil right. Mm. And so that means every person that comes into our being yeah. deserves a right to have a good education. Yeah. And then collectively as a society, we must agree that we want each student to reach their God-given potential. Mm. Okay? And of course, one may say, well, I don't know what this student's potential is. That's right we don't know. That's right. So that's, that's why right. we remove every barrier that we I, can identify mm -hmm. and provide every opportunity for that potential to for to that be potential realized. to happen to mm -hmm. be realized. Yeah. And so as school board members we have to set that clear vision and having that vision means, you know, I want the best for every student, and I believe yeah. every student can succeed and reach that God-given potential. And then we need to set measurable goals within our school district, focusing on student achievement. Mm -hmm. There never is a reason for a school board to say, this is good enough. Yeah. 
what we're doing now is good enough mm -hmm. because there's always room to improve and room to succeed. And part of the responsibility of the school board then is to build that connectivity and relationship with the community and be able to take advantage of, and I say that in a positive way, resources in the community that students can draw from and be able to help um, build that school district. And so what does that look like? And I know I was going to ask a little bit about that in a later question, but, but what, what does that look like of building that relationship between a school board and its community, in your opinion? What, what does that look like? Well, it, it involves a lot, but it begins with the school district being able to be open in communication mm. with the community, mm. okay? And being able to say, these are our goals, okay? And, and invite the community in the formation of those goals. Yeah. What are priorities for you as a community? So it's our vision. Yeah, and mm -hmm. exactly. Vision. And in my district, we've just started going through another strategic process mm. for the next five years, okay? And uh, what are the attributes we want to see in a graduate from our district? What should they be able to do? What type of character do we want to see? What's right. important for all of what that? What do you want that student to look like? Absolutely. And invite the community not only to have a say-so, but then to partner with the district in bringing that about. Hmm. And, and that could come in lots of ways. Uh, it can come in community members being able to volunteer in the school. That could mean after-school programs. It could mean tutoring. It could mean helping with field trips, whatever. Yeah. Uh, it could mean businesses providing opportunities for work-based opportunities mm -hmm. for students to come into their business. It could mean job shadowing for students to come see what you do. It could mean internships for businesses. Uh, it could mean providing financial resources. Mm. I know one of the things, for example, that we do in our district, and many districts do it, is provide um, weekend meals, for lack of a better term. Right. Backpack meals. Man, those and those are so important. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Those are so important. But being able to partner with the district and recognize that a school district belongs to a community. I think that's so important. Not just a school board. Yeah, I think that's so important because you're speaking about transparency too. Mm -hmm. Like, I think so often I've seen, I've seen in my community, um, many who look at our school district and they say like, man, what are they up to? Like, it's almost an idea of, what is the school district up to? Like, what are they, what are they trying to do um, this last year just uh, in 501? So I help out at Eisenhower Middle School, um, Eisenhower, Ross, mm -hmm. and I spend some time at Highland Park, but primarily I'm at Eisenhower Middle School once a week, pretty much a full school day. Um, and being there in the school, I had conversations with the teachers just about different changes that were coming down the pipeline, one mm -hmm. being with the signature music coordinator. And there was just, there was just, there was a fog. There was a fog. Mm -hmm. And as I sat there, as, as I spoke with teachers, they were like, I don't know what's happening to this position or how I'm going to run my program. And so there was this fog. And so I actually went out and facilitated some conversations between the school board, between certain teachers and between administrators because there was, there was confusion. And as I spoke with one of the teachers, she was like, if I don't know what's happening, how can these parents, right? how can these parents trust us with their students like we have to gain clarity and what i hear you talking about is having this this transparency and having this involvement and creating these spaces so that it is a shared vision that's going forth and i think there's a flip side to that too and that is like for one you have to do that in a way where it allows parents to be involved and for two parents have to put forth the effort to also be involved it's it's a both it's a both and, right? And so I had to start learning more about, I was like, man, I wanna, I wanna do something about this. Where do I go? It's like, well, there's a, we have a board meeting once a month. You ever showed up? I'm like, I have not, <laughs> right? It's like, I have not. And so it's like, I had to start getting more involved in, in finding, like looking at the opportunities that were available 
so that I had a seat at the table so I could say so I could speak into the process and say like hey maybe this isn't the best time for most of the parents in our community but if I'm not if I have the time and I'm not making that effort then I'm relying on people who don't maybe understand the context of the people they're trying to reach mm -hmm in order to make this large step to reach them. And so I think there's a both and to seeing that happen, but I agree completely that it has to be a shared vision between the community, between the school board, and there has to be transparency. And I've seen what happens when that doesn't exist and it, it, it erodes trust. It erodes trust. So man, I 100. Yeah, so true. <laughs> and Braille, since you mentioned parents. Okay, 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 yeah. okay. let's go uh, there. Yeah, Let's uh, go uh, there. Uh, I'm gonna uh, run down this track, okay. <laughs> Now, that parental involvement yep. is absolutely critical, mm -hmm. okay? Now, I first got involved with the school district when my kids started school. Same. And yep. uh, they announced there was a PTO meeting. Mm. So, there I am. I'm yep. there. It's your first opportunity. Yeah. And they're like, okay, we need a PTO president. You want to be PTO <laughs> president? <laughs> sure, why not? You know, but... Yeah. Uh, that's how I got involved. And yeah. it's critical, absolutely critical, for parents to be at the table. Yeah. You need to be there, whether you're working with the PTO, whether you're on site council, because every building has a site council, and a site council is part of the Kansas statutes. Mm. And that site council is kind of like an advisory board to your principal. Huh. Yeah, and uh, find yourself there. Uh, at the very least, you got to begin to build that relationship with your students' teachers. Mm. That's at the very least. Your teacher mm. needs to know who you are and that you're concerned <laughs> yep. about that child yep. and that you're there to assist and help, that you're a partner. Mm. You know, ask the teacher, so what can I do to help? Mm. How, how can I help my child? What can right. I help? What can and I it, do? And then also the principal. Yeah. Don't wait till the principal calls you to say, hey, Johnny did this today. And, you know, but right. make yourself familiar with that principal. Introduce yourself to the principal. Make sure that principal knows that you're a partner, mm -hmm. that you're there to support their work and to support the interest of your child. And, yeah. and even I'll go a step further. Even if you have a social worker or a counselor in your building, it doesn't hurt to make yourself aware of them and introduce yeah. yourself to them. Yeah. And, and all of that is going to provide a better environment mm -hmm. conducive to learning for your child yeah. and provide that network and that team support, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm gonna go a step further. Okay. Uh, there are parents that care about their kids very much so. Yep. But we may have this mom that's working two jobs. Come on. All right. Let's, tr let's trying to make it work, yep. you know. Yep. And it's like, I don't have time to be doing all of these other things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So come back to the community. Okay. Right. We need to embrace, surround, help, support any way that we can the integration okay any way that we can you yeah. know yep. and, and 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 that may mean let's say we have students in an after school program mm -hmm. volunteering helping in that way mm -hmm. any way to help support that yep. child and i <clears throat> real world example so i because of because of my job Right, I raise mm -hmm. support so I can be full time here, so I can be able to have that flexibility, go into the schools. It's a, it's a part of my job description yeah. now, right? Um, because of that, I have the time and freedom to be there. Before that, I was self employed, mm -hmm. so I had the time and freedom to be there. I knew that all, I know that all parents don't. No, because my kids were in youth ministry here. I was like, all right, I'm I I would like to help with the youth ministry any way I can. So I ended yeah. up taking over the yeah. youth ministry, yeah. and so I run the youth ministry here now, right? And so, <clears throat> but I. It made sense for me, right? Mm -hmm. It made sense for me. Now, through Girls on the Run, my yeah, daughter's like Girls program. on the Run, they made a couple of friends in Girls on the Run that got real close to them. They invited those friends to start coming to our youth program. We started spending time with them. They started coming to Young Life mm -hmm. in the morning, started coming to our youth program in the evenings. Then they're like, man, can they, can they come over to the house? And it's like, you know what? 
y'all getting to be teenagers, y'all getting pretty close, them attitudes come up, I think having somebody else to bounce some of that energy off of would be great. So I started inviting them over to the house. So they, they'd spend the night at our houses. Mm -hmm. on, and they were like, can we come over on Saturday? If you come over on Saturday, you're going to church with us on Sunday. So now I got two extra dollars, yeah. <laughs> right? And so they're apart. And when an incident comes up at school with them, I'm there. Mm -hmm. And their parents, their parents have to work. They're unable to do it. They have jobs where they have pretty long hours. I hit up, I hit up the parent. Hey, did y'all know this happened at school? This is where we're at. This is what's running. Right. Okay, okay. And I and I keep in in contact with them. And then any things that we offer in the community at the church and things like that, I invite them to be a part mm -hmm. of that. And they show up and they're a part of that. And so it is like you're talking about this this wraparound way of right. well, what where do where do I fit in? What can I do? Can mm -hmm. I support financially? Can I can I check the emails? Is that how I'm doing? Is there someone else who's a part of my community who's there? Um, which just goes back. We we had to run a whole sermon series last year on how to make friends because a lot of adults don't actually know how to yeah. engage yeah. with others yeah. in community. But that is for a different yeah. podcast. <laughs> That's yeah. for a different podcast. But Frank, <clears throat> I want to I want to make sure that I want to make sure we get to this because I. I want to give you an opportunity to speak with this. So, you know, over the last few years, um, racism has been deemed as a public health risk factor. Mm -hmm. right? like, by many organizations, it's been it's been something that we've been talking about more and more as a society, which in some ways I think is good. In some ways, I think we need to refine the conversation. But um, within the Topeka area, there have been a number of controversial issues where race is kind of at the center of those issues. Um, the Topeka High students and what happened in Royal Valley um, and even the, the discussion in Seaman over, you know, finding out that the, that the uh, name that, that Seaman was named after, that he was a part of the KKK and, and having that public conversation and that discourse, which I actually think you guys handled really well. Like I, I read the article about kind of the decision that was made on that. And, um, but I'm, I'm interested to kind of get your take on that as a leader in our educational system. Um, like what direction are, are, are you giving to our school boards and, and thus to our communities as we engage in those things? And, and how are you ensuring like the safety and the unity between our communities and schools? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Royal Valley. I think you meant Valley Center. Valley Center. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Valley Center. When uh, yep. think a high basketball team was playing yep, down there. Yep, Valley yeah. Center. Yeah. Um, let me use this as a prop. Tell me what you see. See a Viking. I'm assuming a seaman Viking. Okay, you see a Viking. Yeah. What do you think I see? See a cup. From your perspective? Yeah, from my perspective. Just a white cup. Okay, I'll turn it. I see a white cup. Yeah, I, I see nothing on my side. And uh, I, I use this as an illustration is because when we experience racism mm -hmm. or when we have racism, it's a failure of folks to see things from another's perspective. Hmm. And so okay. they're only seeing what they see, okay? Yeah. And that just means they're only seeing what they know. Mm. Okay, and uh, there's absolutely no place for racism in public education, mm. none at all. And it goes back to that fundamental belief of mm -hmm. what I said from the very, very beginning about the value of every, every human student. being, yeah. okay? And public schools, because, again, a public education is a civil right, okay? Yeah. And, and, and that means that's fundamental, that's basic. So every student should be able to go to a public school and feel like they belong. Mm. Mm. And, and, and again, there's no place for racism at all. Um, you mentioned uh, my district, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the issue there. And uh, there are folks that did not understand why the students were bringing forth this issue of the name change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it goes back to what I said about the sense of belonging. Hmm. Okay. Because as a student of color, okay, the question is, do you feel like you belong 
in a school that's named after an exalted cyclops of the KKK. Right. Whose right. mission was totally against people of color. Right. And so again, that comes down to failure to look at mm -hmm. other Perspective. perspectives, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we started in my district <coughs> is an equity council. Mm. And uh, one of the objectives of that equity council, and, and of course, when we talk about equity, what we basically are talking about is, in, in terms of education, is every student getting what they need mm. to be successful. Yeah. Okay? And so we're going through a book, doing a book study called Belonging Through a Culture of Dignity. Mm. And uh, there are four pillars in that book that we feel like are very fundamental for a student to feel like they belong. And uh, the first is inclusion, okay? Mm -hmm. And inclusion is engagement within a community where the equal worth and inherent dignity of each person is honored. Hmm where the equal worth and inherent dignity of each, each person, person is, is honored. honored, okay? I like that. Yes, and uh, the second is belonging, and belonging is the extent of which people feel appreciated, <laughs> validated, accepted, and treat it fairly within an environment. Who appreciated, appreciated, validated, validated accepted, accepted, and treated fairly mm. within an <clears throat> environment. Every student should feel like they belong. That is okay. Cool. Uh, the third is culture. Culture. And we're looking at the culture of the school because the culture is the heart and soul of the environment. Come on. That's the feel, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. The way people do things, okay? Yeah. And, and the question we ask ourselves is, okay, do you feel excluded in this culture? Hmm. That's when you're right. totally outside, outside yeah. okay? Do you feel segregated? Mm -hmm. And that's when you identify with a few others, but not but with the whole. But you're still outside. Yeah, you're still separate. It, it, it's like if I draw a triangle, and then outside that triangle, I have a circle with three people in it. Right. So those three in that circle, they're part of that, yeah. but they're segregated and still aren't a part of the triangle. Mm. The third is, are you integrated? Hmm. Okay. And that is when I take that circle and put it inside that triangle. So I'm with everybody else. I'm integrated. Mm -hmm. But the fourth is is when I'm included. And that's when I take the circle away, away. and everybody is in that triangle. And again, it goes back to how you feel the culture and you feel that belonging where you feel appreciated validated, accepted, and treated fairly within that environment. Mm. And then the fourth element is the element of dignity. And that means having an equal worth yeah. to where you are worthy to belong, worthy of empathy, worthy of patience, openness, and worthy of being listened to. Hmm. And, and dignity isn't something that one has to earn. That's just part of you being yeah. here. Yeah. And everybody needs to experience that dignity. And so we look at their four points as a foundation <coughs> for all students feel safe, feeling safe. You mentioned safety, yeah. okay? Yeah. And we feel that's a foundation. If we can get that culture in our schools, mm -hmm where we have inclusion, belonging, and dignity, then students are going to feel safe, okay? Yeah. And the principal is the building leader that can help set that culture. Mm. But even above that, the school board 
and this needs to set the standard for the superintendent and say this is what we expect this is the culture we want in our school and then the superintendent needs to be able to carry that out so that that's carried out at the building level okay yeah and, and so that when you have that culture then that opens the door to building relationships mm -hmm. with the students okay yeah and when you're able to build relationships with the students whether it's the teacher building relationships the principals building relationships, then you're creating a safe school. Man, man, that is so good. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> man, as we, I want us to take a real quick break. And when we come back, a big part of, we call this part of our show the intersection, because okay. it's the place where your questions and the solutions meet, where the resources meet where you are, right? And and I, I want to talk a little bit when we come back from this break about um, how you guys are planning to implement that type of culture, to build that type of culture as we get ready to wrap up. And so we'll be right back here on South by East. Are you interested in podcasting, audio, or visual media, and just don't know how to get started or take your content to the next level? Then Studio 104 was built just for you. A fully functioning audio-visual podcast studio, industry-level equipment, and an affordable price to help you make that album you always wanted, start that podcast, or even share the story of how your business is impacting the community. Book your session along with a free consultation today at www.fellowshiphighcrest.com backslash studio 104. All right, welcome back to the intersection here at South by East. And we are here with uh, Mr. Frank Henderson, who has just dropped the, the bombs on us. And man, when you got to talking about just the power of the culture um, and how the culture of the school really shapes how we view our students mm -hmm. and also what we want to see from our students and how we interact with our students. Man, that, that hit me something fierce. And so I, I wanted to give you a second to talk about how do we move forward with that? Mm -hmm. Some people are going to be listening and they're going to be like, man, that sounds good. And all the definitions sounds good. I'll put that book on my reading list and probably never read it. And, you know, <laughs> some people are going to look at that and be like, man, all that sounds good. Um, but I would like to I would like to ask, how do we move forward with creating a culture that embodies those those mm -hmm. pillars? And how do we bring the community along with mm -hmm. us in mm -hmm. doing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part of that begins with providing opportunities mm -hmm. for the community to engage okay, and, and okay, to okay. learn. Because I mentioned more about the perspective. And, and mm -hmm. a lot of folks don't have a true perspective because their perspective comes from one source. Let me tell you, let me tell you a small definition I say. Uh, everybody can have their opinions. Ignorance is not an opinion. Like, and I, I yeah. say that to people all the time because people will have no information and a whole opinion. Mm -hmm. And they'll know nothing about what they're talking about. They're like, well, I don't know anything about it. I just feel strongly. Ignorance right. is not an opinion. I'm, yeah. I'm going to let you continue. Yeah. No, <laughs> I just want to no, make that No, and, and I agree. It's not. But providing those opportunities. One of the things that we've done a number of times have what we call community meetings. Mm. And uh, this was a whole district meeting where we invited people from the community to come, okay? Yeah. And we had, we, we formed a student group, our students formed it actually. That's awesome. Called the Equity Action Network, okay? Okay. And uh, these students are engaging in, well, that they meet regularly and they talk about issues mm. that may be going on in the school. Yeah. And meet with administration about how do we resolve these issues, mm -hmm. okay? But also with this community meeting, a number of students were brave enough to come forward to tell their stories, yeah. okay? And uh, regardless of what one hasn't experienced in terms of a community member, mm -hmm. it's difficult to dispute somebody's story, story. Yep. when they tell you 
this is what has happened to me, mm -hmm. and this is how it made me feel. Yeah. Anecdotal okay. evidence is still evidence. Because, yeah. Absolutely, because it's hard sometimes for people to visualize and imagine things when they can't put a person to yeah. it. And they haven't personally experienced it. Correct. Like empathy, uh, absolutely. empathy helps us learn. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so when they put a person to it and see mm -hmm. that, their eyes are opening. Yeah. One of the uh, activities the Equity Action Network did last year was had a community forum at the public library, Topeka mm -hmm. Shawnee County Public Library, and had a number of folks there and talked about different things. They have another activity they're doing next month at Washburn University mm. and uh, inviting the community to be a part of it. And they're inviting various uh, leaders in the community of different backgrounds mm. to come and talk and share their experiences and awesome. talk about the good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah. And so a lot of that is exposure and being able to get the story out, mm -hmm. be being able to talk about things. But even, and, and I can't emphasize this enough, back at the building level, that leader, that principal is so critical. Yeah. And that classroom teacher as well, okay? Yeah. And so part of the things that we're doing Equity Council too is, uh, and our council is made up of community members, uh, students, teachers, as well as administrators, principals, mm. is being able to put together uh, some toolkits, for lack of a better term, for staff. Because there are some staff that don't know. So like, for example, if a staff hears uh, some racial comments in the hallway, right. how do you respond yeah. to that? Be being being able support. to equip them Equipped, with, okay, equipped. This is the appropriate response that this is how you handle that. Yep. Because some are like, well, I know that's wrong, but I'm not sure. What do know, I do? How do I engage? What do I do yep. about that? Yep. I've, mean, I've been in a know. situation where I saw youth engaging. There's, I was working with a, an organization that was doing something for youth and uh, kind of a pre predominantly white organization. Mm -hmm. um, the youth that were there at the program, predominantly African-American, Latino, and there were some rival schools involved. Yeah. Of course, fight breaks out that night. A lot of staff just watched. And it was like, what, what happened? I happened to be there. And so I broke up the fight and stopped mm -hmm. it. And I came back and I talked with that staff member. And I was like, what happened? They're like, oh, I didn't know if they were just playing. Yeah. They, they didn't understand the call. Yeah. They were like, I thought that they were just playing. Like, yeah. I thought that was how, you know, just a little roughhousing. And yeah. I didn't want to impose because I felt like I didn't have the right Mm -hmm. to speak into that situation. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a complete, it's like, and I knew this person's heart. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's a complete lack of equipping that has led right. to this. And I was like, the impact that, and I had to have a meeting with him and tell him like, hey, the impact, the potential impact that you had on that student has almost been completely shattered. Mm -hmm. Because court, to that student, you are nothing more than a tree outside. Yeah. Like they didn't look to you any more than they looked to the road to help mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. in this situation. Um, and it, it was a complete lack of culture. And I, and I told them, I was like, if we don't fix this in this organization, I will, I will never volunteer here again because the kids aren't safe. Mm -hmm. And so like that, the SEL, the social emotional yeah. learning, the training around how do I deal with kids with trauma, the training around mm -hmm. understanding um, <clears throat> racial relations in America, mm -hmm. in history, how do I interact, how do I move? It's mm -hmm. more than just wokeness. It's more than just um, niceties on top of education. It is pertinent for safety. Because if we don't know how to engage our students in these times, we can't keep them safe. And if a child isn't safe, we know for studies show, if a child doesn't feel safe, right. they can't learn. Right. If their major needs aren't taken care of, they can't learn. And so we can never expect to educate students if we can't protect students. And we cannot protect students unless we are equipped. Absolutely. Absolutely. And feeling emotionally Mm -hmm. safe in an environment safe. Say that. is just as, critical just as critical as feeling physically safe. Yep. 
because like you just said, you can't learn if one isn't feeling emotionally safe in an environment. Mm -mm. And it goes back to that sense of yep. belonging. And when you feel unsafe emotionally, like I did some studies on the on polyvagal and um, mm -hmm. different deals of that nature. When, when a student feels unsafe, because I don't know that everyone knows this, when a student feels unsafe and they go into, um, like their system kicks up, fight, flight, or freeze kicks up. Once you go into, fight, there's fight or flight, and then the next mm -hmm. level is actually freeze in the polyvagal system. Yeah. Once you go into fight or flight, your prefrontal cortex shuts down. Mm -hmm. So if a student comes to school hungry and they're trying to figure out where their next meal is coming from, if a student has been bullied and they know that their bully is gonna be in the class, or their bully's gonna be in the mm -hmm. next class, or they know something's gonna happen at lunch, and they've gone into that fight or flight, you're gonna get some extreme behavior and they're not gonna hear a single word you yeah. say. And then some students are going to go into freeze, which is where your system actually shuts down. And so you no longer can yeah. even fight back. So that student is never going to advocate for themselves mm -hmm. because they're frozen. Yeah. And so that student will never even tell you, I can't hear a single thing that you're saying. Right. And you can be like, ah, I keep trying and I keep speaking. And I keep asking and I keep trying to mm -hmm. help and I keep working through. But it's like the student isn't safe. Right. And you may not even ever see it or know it. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not equipped and trained in knowing hey, how do I interact? What could be going on here? What should I be troubleshooting? Mm -hmm. um, you can be throwing paint on a wall that's, that's, that is completely repellent. Like you can be, you just, it's water off a duck's mm -hmm. back because they can't actually receive anything that you're, that you're doing. And that's a waste of everybody's time, tax dollars, and it doesn't allow us mm -hmm. to, uh, to help that student uh, fulfill their potential. Yeah, and, and I can't say enough about the importance of professional development mm. and that training. And, and you had mentioned wokeness, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and unfortunately there's that dialogue out there that mm -hmm. begins to put any type of training on diversity yeah. into a category of quote wokeness, mm -hmm. you know, and, and diversity recognizes the fact that everybody isn't like me. Yeah. Everybody isn't like you. Mm -hmm. So how critical it is for us to learn about how others are, yep. how others respond, mm -hmm. how I can best communicate with someone, how I can truly understand yeah. how someone may interpret words that I use mm -hmm. so that I can benefit yep. that student, and we can so that that yeah. student can have a better experience. Yes. And we can have truly nuanced opinions. Um, I kind of want to go out here. I okay. Where are you going I'll, now, brother? I want to say, oh no, no. <laughs> I just, man, I know you. I know you yeah. love your district. Um, and I, I want to say, as I was looking into how USD what is it, three, what's, what's, your, what's your district? I'm sorry, senior three forty five. I know it's not officially it's senior 345. district. Three forty five. Three forty five. USD mm -hmm. three forty five. Um, how they handled the situation going back to uh, Mr. Seaman. And how uh, they were like, hey, this name has meant something to the legacy of the school, to the legacy of this community. There's been a lot built into this name. Um, but we want to publicly disavow this person. We want to separate this name from this person. We want to acknowledge the hurts that have been done, the harm mm -hmm. that has been done. We want to make sure that people are educated about what has happened and where we've come from. And we want to preserve um, what this name has meant to this to this community, this life that is built that has been built that is separate from the life of uh, of of this individual, right? And and as I read through that, I was like, that is a brilliant conversation to be had that I feel like we should be having all around the country when it comes to. Should we be tearing down this statue or should we be moving this? Are we, are we erasing history? Are we doing? It's like looking at the people that are here now. What does this mean to the people who are here now? Both the people who are like, I, I cherish this name. This is my community. This is where I grew up. This is where I learned. This is where I found my wife, where I found my husband. And those who say that name causes me to feel ostracized. That name causes me to feel uh, separated and segregated and speaking into that. Like, I felt like that statement, and I don't, I don't actually know how you feel about, mm -hmm. about where that ended, but I felt like the, the nuance in that conversation 
was something that I feel like could be modeled and replicated around the country when it comes to these types of situations, because these do really cause um, a lack of felt safety um, in our schools and in our communities. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are a lot of strong feelings around that. Yep. And, and first of all, on <laughs> yep. that topic, I can't say enough good things about our students mm. because it was a group of students Come on. that said, I'm going to research this <laughs> yeah, they probably and I'm going to get down to the bottom of this because yeah. I heard probably 20 years ago hmm. that uh, Mr. Seaman was a KKK, a Klansman, hmm. and, and I just kind of blew it off. It's like, you know, yeah, yeah I mean, you know. Whatever. Right, Car. you know. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, to be honest with you, I didn't really believe it. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, people always come up with okay. something, you know. Right. But these students researched it Research. like no other. Uh -huh. And they came up with literally hundreds mm. of pages of documents. Wow. Hundreds of pages of documents. Students that substantiated not only was he a Klansman, but he was the exalted Cyclops right. of the KKK. Hmm. And uh, they had writings in his own words that he had published in the newspaper yeah. about how strong the Klan is in Topeka. And uh, basically they had everything in terms of what his objectives were and what the Klan's objectives were hmm. and what they were trying to do. And so it was, you know, a, a harsh reality for a lot of folks. We have folks in the district been there for multi-generations. And uh, as you had indicated, you know, have a lot of pride yeah. in the name of the district. Yeah. Some not even knowing not there was a Fred Seaman, yeah. but just in the yeah. name of the yeah. district. And so, you know, as you talked about the resolution that we ended up passing, mm -hmm. uh, removed his image. Uh, throughout the district yep. and we have a museum mm -hmm. and so uh, his picture is in the museum along with all of the research that was done by the students as well as the resolution that we passed yep. basically in this resolution uh, disavowing what he stood for and all the works of the KKK and basically saying that uh, from this moment forward, we're going to ensure that uh, each and every student has a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And diversity and equity is going to be a priority. And we want to provide the best opportunities for every student. Yeah. And so that's kind of how that landed. Yeah. So. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question with that? And, sure. Um, just this past week, we did a community program to honor the students at Topeka High for the way they responded in the face of racism. Mm -hmm. And then we, we, we also honored the Highland Park basketball team for the way they responded to a robbery threats and different things of that nature. Mm -hmm. What does it say about our community that we, we felt the strong need, we, we had people that flew from around the world to come and give special awards to those uh, basketball players for the way they reacted in those two situations. Yeah. If I remember right, it was two young white students in the Seaman District that first kind of doing research mm -hmm. yeah. came upon this knowledge. I don't remember us as a community celebrating those students in their efforts and even in their response to things maybe not going the way they had hoped they would go. But their nuance, mm -hmm. saying like, I have these feelings and this is the way things were and they, the way they react. I don't remember us as a community saying it's really valuable to celebrate these students in their reaction. What does that say about us? And then, even now, do you think, because it was a group of clergy who started that, that mm -hmm. for, even now, how should we, there's still time, I believe, yeah. react 
and show support for those mm -hmm. students. Yeah, the students were recognized by various groups. Okay. Yeah, uh, the Living the Dream Committee mm -hmm. awarded them awesome. recognition. Mm -hmm. And then just um, not that many months ago, another group recognized them again oh, that's good. That's awesome. for some yeah. effort. But awesome. I don't think they were actually recognized by the city or community right. as a whole in terms of like the mayor and, and you know, and all of that. But they, they did receive some recognition for their efforts. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I just can't say enough about the students. Those two, you know, started the research, but there were so many others yeah. that got aboard and they launched a full campaign for the name change and just, you know, went full force. And I, you know, I wanted to bring that up because of the power story. So mm -hmm. when, <laughs> when we were debating about whether or not to keep the name, I saw it everywhere. Yeah. And then I started thinking about, as I was getting ready to interview you a couple months ago, I was like, whatever happened with that? <laughs> I was like, whatever happened with I never saw the resolution. Oh, okay. I had to go look for it. I had to go look mm -hmm. for it. The, the, the publicity on the conflict did not match the publicity on the on resolution, the resolution. Yeah. and yeah. so and that is the story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is inspiring when i saw that and i read i was yeah. like Man, that is an inspiring story like this this gives us a model for so yeah. many areas and shows how impactful learning just like you talked about earlier learning the stories yeah. of our youth of our communities is and so that's part of the reason i wanted to talk about yeah. that today because i was like i i don't know that people know what actually happened, and I want them to see what impact students mm -hmm. from their community, engaging their community and their school board together yeah. made on an entire community and how there was a resolution that came at the end mm -hmm. where two polarized sides were able to say, okay, I understand why we're doing this, and people were able to see both sides of the cup mm -hmm. like that is incredible yeah yeah and uh you know if you remember we had put together a committee mm -hmm. a working group and all of these folks were graduates of seaman high school so they were you know vested right, in right. that and worked with the kansas leadership center out of wichita that mm. kind of led that whole movement but uh, at the end, they presented a report to us of, of all of that. And uh, the board, I, I'd say pretty much, and I'm using that term pretty much because there was no formal vote, okay? Yeah. But pretty much knew that there was not enough votes to either keep the name mm -hmm. or to change the name, Th that it would be like most likely 4-3 mm -hmm. either way, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, as you said, people were, after everything that was said and done with all the students and the report and all the work, people were kind of able to understand a little bit more yeah. and understand different perspectives, okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what brought folks to be able to come to a resolution awesome. to where it wasn't a matter of, okay, people that wanted the name changed didn't get what they wanted. Mm -hmm. People that wanted it to totally stay the same without any type of action didn't get what they wanted. And so the resolution was an agreement. Yeah. Now, just a, another thing about that, since we're talking about this whole this whole topic. Mm -hmm. In our district, we have very few students of color. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the majority of our students are Caucasian. I have slid through. I've, I've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> the students that were driving this name change mm -hmm. were predominantly Caucasian students. Mm -hmm. It wasn't driven by the students of color, okay? And so this just sends a strong message yeah. 
that you can, if you choose to do so, <laughs> look at those not like you and understand their perspective. Yes. And realize that I can take action. Yeah. Uh, and, and I recall at one of our community meetings, and unfortunately some of the members of our community, the adults, weren't real kind mm. to our students all mm. the time. Mm. And, and I remember at one meeting, a community member had got up to the mic and said some things that weren't very kind about our students. Yeah. And uh, one of our students then followed and basically, to be honest with you, tears were streaming down this young lady's face. Mm. And she said, you know, I really didn't appreciate the comments you made. Those are my friends you are speaking about. Mm. They just want to be able to go to school and feel like they belong and are accepted and they don't want to be harassed. Mm. As we get ready to wrap up here in the intersection, <clears throat> I want to pull this into context. For one, I want to thank you, Frank, for being here, for sharing those stories and for giving that perspective. And I really hope that people are able to take a lot away from that. I know that there's a lot of, a lot of gems in there. Um, but I want to I want to pull us into this context before, before we cut back to the debrief. <clears throat> Some of you may be wondering, well, what does this have to do with education? In episode two, we talked about uh, the future of education, what education could look like. And in order to do that, we had to talk about what, what education is. And one of the things we spoke about was that education is, is a lot more than school, but education is, is, our education is really what is driving the culture of our country. In many ways, it is driving the culture of our country. And so what happens there is reflected out in the rest of, of the community. That's why controlling the laws that have to do with education, that's why controlling the curriculum that has to do with education is so important because whether you believe it or not, kids are being indoctrinated by something. They're either being indoctrinated by you or they're being indoctrinated by someone else. You have to control what the doctrine is. And so it's super important as we look at that. And so education is more than just eight to four, eight to three, um, Monday through Friday. It is a creator of culture in communities and at the same time reflective of culture in communities. The story that you just shared was one of the educational system integrating with the community and transforming part of the culture of a community through education. We have the ability to partner with our educational system to transform the culture of our community around us. Are we using that opportunity? So as we wrap up today, I want to thank you, Frank. I want to thank you for being here, man, for sharing, My pleasure. man, yeah. and just for being an incredible advocate for students and their dignity um, and for, for the work that you have done and that I know that you're going to continue to do. And uh, I hope to get to partner with, uh, with uh, USD 345 at some point right. on something, man. So right now we're going to kick it back to the debrief as we finish out this episode of South by. Man, I really appreciated that conversation that you and Frank had. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm constantly being made more aware of the weight of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, I, I sit in that in that space in quite a few circles, um, and it always helps me develop and grow to hear other leaders' stories. Yeah. Um, not so much just their victories and the things they've accomplished, but the areas where they've struggled. Oh yeah. And um, Frank not only leads his 
local school board, but he's the national school board president. And when you when you look at that, man, this I think probably only Congress has had more heated debates over the last few years mm-hmm. um, than the, the local school board. Right. And then I can imagine how that gets elevated um, when you go to a national stage with such diversity and approach and um, where we stand on topics. And so uh, it really helped me. Uh, in the first part of your conversation, he mentioned how a good school district invites and listens to the community to help develop the vision Mm -hmm. for education. You're a parent with schools, with with kids in our our local public schools. Mm -hmm. I have kids now, my kids were in uh, TPS and, and now are in a Small private school. Yep. How do you? How do you? Do you feel like you're getting invited in? No. And that was the thing that really stuck out to me too was you know and uh, with Jake we talked about the story that we want to tell, yeah. the story that we're looking to tell, and how our schools will really help shape that story of who we are in the future. And as we had this conversation, and it felt like Frank just expounded on, like, yes, the school board, we are, sh- we are the vision casters for an entire community. And I was like, I have no idea where my district is going. I don't know what we want a student to look like or, or what that vision is. And, and bro, I'm going to tell you, uh, you know this about me is I, when I was a youth pastor, I, I told you, I used to go to every school board meeting. Um, when I was single, I had no kids. I used to go to every school board meeting because mm-hmm. I was a youth pastor in the district where I yeah. lived down in Texas, and I, I learned so much. And I got to sit on teams. I was on a part of a, a special uh, superintendent advisory committee mm-hmm. um, because they saw me present all the time. And so I, I, I feel like the principals that I worked with and, and right around my house at the different schools invited me in and listened to my voice. And I got to tell you, when I was, when I was here, um, I don't feel that. And here's here's the crazy thing, my kids now at, at a small Christian school, I, probably thirty kids. I'm not getting it there either. Mm-hmm. I get invited to programs. <laughs> I get invited to field trips and activities. Yep, yep. I'm at the stuff. And I I don't feel like I've ever been invited to be a part of the visioning. Yeah. For my kids' education. Bro, and here's the thing, man. I'm. I'm in the school, right? And I, I'm not trying to talk bad about 501 and because I also want to share a word that stuck out once we get done with kind of this part of the conversation, a word that stuck out to me that I feel like could help us move forward. Um, but <clears throat> I'm sitting with teachers and I shared part of that story of how I had to become, you know, Sherlock Holmes to figure out what was happening with, yes. a, with a prominent position um, in the school board. I don't feel like a lot of our teachers know either. I, I, I email back, well, I say back and forth, I email um, the principal at my school who is, who is the leader, and man, he is, he, he does, he really cares about our students, man, mm-hmm. I get to speak with him day in and day out and hear his heart mm-hmm. and how it breaks for a lot of our students and how hard he works to see us um, try to thrive and, and sometimes just survive, right? But uh, I don't know that he knows either, right? Like, I don't know that he knows either. And so I don't think that it's even just people being invited into the visioning, but are people visioning? Are we actually dreaming at all? Well, let me tell you how easy it is. After listening to you and Frank speak, I realized that we sat down with um, the Center for Public Partnership and Research out of Mm -hmm. the University of Kansas, Mm-hmm. And we planned this thing. I started with a vision I had about wanting to take this deep dive and yep. learn more. And um, we, we said, man, we want to have everybody from all places in this continuum and be a part of it. So we had Melissa Roker, and then we had a futurist with Jake um, Dunnigan, and then now we have uh, Frank Henderson, National School Board President, uh, local mm-hmm. school board president. Mm-hmm. And we have, we're have we going to have principals and, and um, parents and... Yep. All these different things, and I realized there's not a student speaking in the whole season. Somebody actually asked me that the other day. They're like, "Are you going to have a student on there?" And, and I was then like, th- that was the card. We've no. we've committed the cardinal 
yep. seeing. <laughs> yep. Um, and it, it, and it showed me just how easy it is. And it's like for here, you know how we walk. And one of our key principles is, you know, is uh, relocation or practicing yep. proximity and yep. um, just being present mm -hmm. and and hearing, the, listening to the community. And we repeated that same thing in the planning. And I hope you know we find a way to correct that before the season ends. Um, but I, I, I think. And his desire to just even foster a space for listening, we've forgotten some of the key components. And I think the same deal I, I have found over my life, that it's easier to get people to buy into something that they were a part of creating. Yep. Yep. Man, and I've seen even like the first night of Bridge Builders. When we had bridge builders and we were talking about our community and, and how our community got to be the way that it is. And I, I looked out and I was like, man, this is a public forum. There were students sharing like, man, here are ideas that we have um, with just what you've shared with us and what we know about our community of how we could improve and where we can go. And here's the thing that I love about when we engage our students. The crazy deal is for all the great and crazy things we want to do, like you talked about um, the time that you spent before you had kids and when you were single, and it's like, hey, I had this time, I was at every single meeting and I was always there and involved. Our kids actually have that kind of time now. Like our kids have the time and space to dream mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Like our kids have the energy to generate limitless ideas now. And often we don't call them to the table to, to mine the resource that they give us. And that's what the big thing that stuck out to me that as I, as I listened to Frank and thought through what he was saying, this word, he kept saying this word opportunity, mm -hmm. opportunity to gain perspective, opportunity to learn, opportunity for exposure, opportunity to transform culture. And I'm like, man, are we leveraging the opportunities that are in front of us? That is one of the most powerful things about the situation with Shani Heights mm. and well, not Shani Heights with uh, Seaman. Seaman. Yeah, it, it, it was Seaman. One of the most powerful things with the whole uh, Seaman uh, situation, mm -hmm. where the two students found the, the first thing they did is they didn't rush to saying we got to fix the problem. Yeah, they slowed down enough in the S Seaman School District to say, "Let us listen," mm -hmm. and um, and listening is hard. Um, because you're going to be challenged with ideas that may differ from yours um, and are probably almost uh, or surely going to differ from yours. And, and then the real struggle starts of whether you keep listening or whether you turn off and start talking. Yeah. Um, and I felt like they listened and just I mean, the overwhelming... Um, considerate responses of those students in those moments as they had tears in their eyes, as they, I remember seeing adults who were helping to lead that conversation. I was just around some adults during that time. Mm -hmm. And I remember them like coming out of those conversations, just being broken mm -hmm. by how some of the students were treated. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's missed too often. Yeah. Um, when we talk, I, I just hear so much talk about this generation, this and this generation, that, and, and it sounds good and looks funny on TikToks, but no one likes to continually be the butt of our jokes. And um, I think we discredit far too often this next generation. I'm encouraged by him. Yeah. I, I'm learning some stuff, yeah. not just in these situations, but with some of the technology and different things of that nature, that they are, are just picking up. And um, I'm not a te technologically illiterate person. Right. right. Um, <laughs> and I'm still struggling to stay up to speed with some of the technology and the way they use things. And so... Mm -hmm. Um, which that's an opportunity that our youth have is man that time that time and energy that they have is incredible and that's why it's so important that we create an environment that's inclusive did you catch those three pillars that he did like the first one was inclusion the definition that he gave for inclusion bro uh, where the equal worth and inherent dignity of each person is honored like that ain't tokenism like real yeah. inclusion man Here's the deal. For the cost of this whole season, if, if we have to somehow write down and get out in, in some graphic images and different things of that nature, 
his definition of belonging, yeah. his definition of culture, of integration, of inclusion and dignity. Mm. Man, we, we got to get all those out somewhere, yeah, man. And I, we, I believe there is a resource, so I want to make sure that I get with him and capture that resource and have that in the show notes too because there was a book yeah, that he was pulling But if from. we can just, we just need our tech team to pull out yeah. those definitions to put in an easy, eye-level place. For people to access, yes. To, for people to access and go back to. Um, because if we can build not just our schools around that and the vision for those, but a lot of other areas, I think we'd be healthier. Yep. Um, I think we would benefit as a society. Um, and then he said this. He says, um, it's hard to refute a person's experience and story. You might not like it, but it's hard to refute. And, um, man, I, so often I get that, right? Because uh, it's hard... It almost impossible to adjust a entire organization's direction based on one person's experience. Mm -hmm. You would constantly be pivoting and never moving, yep. right? Yep. Yep. Um, but like you said, anecdotal evidence is still evidence. evidence. And so it's like, what do we do? What do we do because of this? And how, I believe even if you can't, sway a whole organization in the vision of uh, a whole organization or school mm -hmm. district based on one person's experience, every person should feel like they have been listened to and heard and valued. And so even though uh, we can't do broad sweeping changes because of every person's experience, we can respond yes. in a listening and thoughtful, dignifying way Mm -hmm. to every person's experience. Yeah. And I believe it starts by having a culture that fosters belonging, one that um, includes integration, one that builds dignity, right? And yeah. so we just, and that's inclusive. Yeah, that's inclusive. And so uh, I, I love, I just love where you went with those things because the solutions that he was offering, um, you didn't hear him say, oh, we got to go do this big DEI training. <laughs> the solutions that you heard him propose was, we found more opportunities mm -hmm. for these different parties to spend time together. Come on. And, yeah. um, and that's, the, that's the dirty little secret. We, we keep finding out that this DEI training stuff is not working. No. And that it's time together in community together. Um, building this type of culture that's really advancing the ball. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just uh, applied the forward thinking um, of our brother Frank and what he's championing as he goes around and travels. Um, and a lot of times people just don't understand the work, right? They don't understand the work. And it doesn't seem like the work when you're not out leading all the marches yep. Yep. and different things of that nature. And you know what? There's a place for marching and different things. I will... Uh, will not speak against that. Uh, and then there's there's work that happens even outside of that. And I think it's important for us to recognize that also. Um, I just, man, I was so impressed with that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I hope that this episode was impactful to, to all of our listeners and viewers as it was to me. Yeah, man, and I'm, dude, I'm, I'm so, man, I'm loving this season. Um, yeah. And I'm excited to continue to walk forward with thought leaders and leaders in in this organization that we call the educational system and to see more opportunities for change. After every episode, man, I'm seeing more and more that how we leverage this opportunity really will shape not only the future for our students, but for generations to come. Can I, I, I want to end this here. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a guy that I follow on social media uh, because I'm on this 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 health and wellness journey of my own. His yeah. name is Run Jones, and he calls himself Big Run Jones. And um, he had this one reel where he talks about America didn't get fat um, because it ate form raised versus wild salmon, mm. right? And he says, often in this journey of health and wellness, we argue about the wrong things. 
I see so many people arguing about um, the way that our kids learn math or if they still write in cursive or not. <laughs> Advancing our society won't come because our kids can write in cursive or which way they solve the math problem. And I think we settle for far too less in that we don't argue as well as we should for the things that really matter. Mm -hmm. And so we choose lesser arguments because we feel unsafe and unqualified to have the true arguments. Ooh. I feel like if we would move to a point of arguing to be a part of the visioning for our school districts, whether it's a small Christian school or the large public school, and if we would argue for school districts that were truly inclusive, that fostered belonging, that built a healthy culture of exploration and true critical thinking, mm -hmm. um, one that built itself on integration of the latest technology and skills for all, not just the quote unquote gifted. Yeah. Um, one that was also full of dignity where every child felt like their best and their most and their highest was recognized and honored. Mm. That that would move the needle. And I believe those are the things that we should be fighting for and arguing for. Man, it's been a, a, a true joy. I, we're only in season three or in episode, episode three, three of the know? season. And so I hope that you're ready for this ride because it just keeps going from here. Let's get it in. Let's get it in. See y'all next time, South by East. All right. Thank you for tuning into the South by East podcast where we meet you at the intersection of culture and community. For more information on resources shared, check the show notes and we'll see you at the next intersection. We out.